So you know what? Uh, allow God, amen. God wants to speak to you tonight, amen. He wants to He wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you. And he wants to change not just your heart, but he wants to change your mind, amen. So you know what? Uh, you open up your hearts this evening, amen. You allow God to bless you, amen. Let's give him one walk, as the brother comes up. Amen. Give God one more praise. Woo! Come on and thank him. Hallelujah. He's a good God. Amen. He's been good to us. He's blessed us. Amen. He's kept us in this famine. Come on now. Come on. We are blessed. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I said it this morning. I'll say it again. I know whether it's a cliche or whatever you want to call it that the building is not the church Come we on. are. Come on. Come on. But I tell you what, I love being in the house of the Lord. That's Amen. Right. Amen. 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 David said I was glad when they asked me in the house of the Lord. And I'm glad to be here tonight. Yes. I'm glad to be in his presence. And I'm ready to hear from God. Amen. Yes. So if you have your Bibles this evening, I'm going to go to the book of Exodus, chapter 18. I want you there say Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to minister this evening on releasing explosive ministry. Mm. I said releasing explosive ministry. Exodus chapter 18 verse 13. Yeah. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning into the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto eve? And Moses said unto him, to his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people. That is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the, the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and placing over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. It shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and thy shall bear this burden with thee. If thou do this thing, and God commanded thee to do so, then thou shalt be able to endure all these people, and shall all go there to their place in peace. Amen. Powerful scripture of God that God wants us to understand, and something that I am convinced of this evening, that there has been a spiritual awakening in America. We are about to see a great revival. Because I believe we're in the last days. Yes, as we see what's happening in our nation and in our government and the rioting and everything. How many know the world needs Jesus? Amen. There is a revival that's on its way. Coming to the house of God. Because people are looking for answers. They're looking for something. They're looking for hope. And that hope lies in Jesus. Yes. But the worst thing that can happen for us as a church or any church. It's not to be ready when revival comes. Because the secret to success is being ready when opportunity comes. Someone said two farmers prayed for rain. One prepared the field, the other one didn't. Which one do you really think believed it was going to rain? See, if we believe what I just said to you, that God is going to move and fill every chair, and you're going to have to vacate this property to get a bigger building to be able to house the house of God, then you've got to believe tonight, we've got to get to work. Yes, amen. Because if we're going to grow a church, we must grow leaders. Can you say it? Yes, amen. If we're going to grow a church, we must grow leaders. 
Amen. That's right. And so we've got to change the way we think this evening and understand that we've got to get busy discipling men and women for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Teaching them to die to self and to get into what we call the vision of God and understanding that we serve a mighty God. And because we serve a big God, he's given a big vision to your pastor. Come on. So big that he can't do it by himself. Amen. He needs help. Yes, amen. I believe in miracles. I praise God for miracles. But what we need tonight and what we're going to need in the future is not just miracles. We're going to need help. Yes, amen. Yeah. We're going to need workers. Yes, yes, amen. We're going to need servants. Yes. We're going to need people that will understand We've got to rally together to make this thing happen for the kingdom of God. Yes, amen. I believe that this thing that we have encountered is about to end. It's time to get back in the house of God. Come on, yes. And do what we've been called to do, which is win souls. Yes. Disciple people for the glory of God and continue to plant churches in Jesus' name. Amen. The Marine Corps has a powerful slogan that I want to share with you tonight that I believe is needed. If we're going to do what God has called us to do, it says we're not taking applications, only commitments. Mm. God tonight is looking for commitment from his people. He's looking for people that will understand that the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is coming. And we must be ready for his coming. But we must prepare people to begin to entertain this revival when it comes. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, able men. Able means having the necessary power, skills and resources or qualifications, having or showing unusual talent, intelligence, skill or knowledge, an able leader, capable or fit to do the job at hand, able and available. Can you say amen? amen. We need faithfulness in these last days. I understand what's going on in the house of God right now. And some of you may still be in fear of coming to the house of God. No one's going to judge you if you come with a mask and gloves. But you need to come back to the house of God already. Yeah. Right. Been hiding in your house, can you say amen? Come on. It's time for you to make a choice and just get back in the house of God and come and worship. Come on now. And believe what you say you believe, that you're covered in the blood. That this family, come on, that this virus will not touch you or your family in Jesus' name. Because what we need is availability from you. Listen, praise God if uh, you play the drums better than anybody else in any other church. Come on. Praise God if you play guitar or bass better than anyone in any other church. Praise God if you can sing better than anybody else. Come on. But if we can't depend on you, on. what good are you? Mm. Because we can't depend on you to come. The Bible says an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Mm. Sometimes you're eating and you forget you've got a cavity and you're tearing <laughs> into that burro. Come on, <laughs> you're having Holy Ghost with carnitas and you're just going to town. All of a sudden you bite into that cavity and you just stop. Come on now, you just stop and you do something you never thought you'd do. You say, "I'm done." The burrito's halfway and you say, "I don't want no more." What do you mean you don't want no more? Mm. What do you mean? No. It hurts too much. I forgot I had this bad tooth. Uh oh. You know, that's how pastors feel when we come and we open the doors and you say, Well, see you tonight, Pastor. All right, see you tonight, brother. We'll be ready here for prayer. And we look to the door and you don't come in. Mm. You remind me that you're an unfaithful tooth or a foot out of joint. Come on, you ever sprain your ankle and you forget about it? You watch your TV, you get up to go get something, and all of a sudden you realize, ow, oh, I forgot I twisted my ankle. I forgot, huh? That's how people are sometimes. They forget to be faithful. Listen, we got to get ready for what God's about to do. Yes. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6 is not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Come on now. It's God's will that we be in his house tonight. Amen. It's his will that we be in his house and that we come with a heart full of praise. Come on, somebody. Yes. A heart full of thanksgiving. Yes. Come on. Thanking him for his mercies and his grace. And, of course, 
or our salvation, thank you, Jesus. Come on. And get excited about God and yes. know that He's going to save your family. Yes. He's going to save your children, no matter where they are. Yes. Nobody's too far gone for God. We serve an utmost God. Yes, that's right. Amen. You can so save anybody, can you say amen? amen. You gotta get excited tonight. Yes, yeah. hallelujah. Know the God you serve. He's about to do a great work among us. We're gonna be a part of an end revival. Yes. But we've amen. got to be ready, can you say amen? Yes, amen. Woo! Come on now. Avail means to be of good use or value. To be effective or to serve and help. To be effective, can you say amen? It's time to stop coming to church and just sitting in your chair. Yes. Come on, it's time to say, Pastor, what can I do to be a part of what God wants to do? Find your place in the body and go to work, can you say amen? Quit being a spectator. Come on, somebody. Become a participator. Get involved in what God is doing now. It'll, it'll, it'll stir your spirit, man, when you begin a part of something like this. We're involved in the greatest thing on earth. Amen. Saving souls. Hallelujah. Seeing people changed by the power and the glory of God. But we need men and women that will make themselves available to the kingdom of God. Amen. What does it say? Look for these type of people, able men, such as fear God. Such as fear God. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Come on now. See, when people fear God, they'll always do what's right. Because they know they don't have to worry about what they think, they got to worry about what He thinks. A couple of weeks ago, I was coming home, and I, as far as I know, my heart was right. I, I was living right, and I. Coming around the corner, I hadn't done something. I'm going back home. I got gas or something. I'm coming home. And I'm just worshiping, listening to some music. And I'm just going to turn right to go to my house. And out of nowhere, the scripture hits me. Don't fear man who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. Uh -huh. and I was like, man, where, where'd that come from? Come on. But it reminded me, no matter how long I'm saved, I got to fear the Lord. I gotta walk in the fear of God, can you say amen? Yeah. Philippians 2 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, if you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. Knowing that you serve a holy God, can you say right, amen? amen? We serve a holy God. And we must approach him that way. We must approach him in holiness and righteousness and know the God that we serve expects us to be like him. And so we must live a life, man. No, no, not a fear where, you know, he's, he's looking to crush you because you make a mistake. No. But a fear of knowing that what would I do if God left me? Listen, man, I, I've been saved 40 years and sometimes every now and then it'll hit me and I can't help but weep and I go, man, if I backslid tomorrow, what would I do when I wake up tomorrow? Who would I talk to? Because he's the first one I talked to when I opened my eyes. Yes, amen. Who would I talk to? Who would be there for me when no one else understands? Mm -hmm. Come on. Who would keep me? Who would protect me? I'd be lost without the Lord. That's right. So I, I, I fear him because I never want to sever that relationship with God. And we've got to be careful that we must have a, a balanced fear. Not an unwise fear. You look at the scriptures that you see in Matthew 27 where Judas goes back to the Pharisees. He realizes he makes a mistake and conviction comes upon him and he goes. But he goes to the wrong people. And he cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. Why? Because he went to the wrong people where he couldn't find forgiveness. Sure conviction hit. Sure he realized he messed up. But instead of going to God, he goes to man. Man can't help you. That's right. Why would you confess to a man in a box who doesn't have the power to forgive you? That's right. So he goes to these priests and they, they say, what, what do you want? Well, I made a mistake and I want to give you your money back. I, I made a big mistake and I, I messed up and I'm sorry. They said, what do you have to do with you? That's your problem. 
And they threw the money down on the ground. And they took that money and they bought what's called the potter's field and he hung himself. Nobody talks about it, but he hung himself. And the Bible says his stomach busts open. His intestines hit the ground. That's why they call it the field of blood. But had he gone to Jesus, he would have found forgiveness. Because in the same book, Matthew 26, verse 75, the Bible says that Peter denies the Lord. Come on now. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, which he has said before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went and wept bitterly. And nowhere in the scriptures do you find where someone led him back to Christ. Where they said, Peter, I know you messed up, but we serve a loving God. No, what? No, you won't find it in the scriptures. But somehow, some way, he learned something in his time with Jesus. He learned and he believed that he could be forgiven. And even when Jesus rose from the dead, he says, What? Run and tell the disciples and Peter that I am back. Right. And Peter, he mentioned him by name because he wanted them to know, Peter, I still love you. Amen. Peter, I still love you and I forgive you. Come on. And what happened? Peter doesn't say where he repented. But what happens on Pentecost? He preaches and thousands get saved. Why? Because he understood the fear of the Lord. Yeah. He didn't go to man for forgiveness. Come Are you on. hearing me today? Come on. There's only forgiveness in Jesus. Amen. But what prompted him to ask for forgiveness? The fear of the Lord. Listen, we, we must walk in the fear. Can you say amen? 2 Samuel chapter 12, 1 through 24, you find the story of David when he fell. You know? And the Bible says, And David arose, he washed and anointed and changed his apparel, came and worshipped, went home and required. Required. I looked that word up. What does it mean to require? Come on now. Huh? What does it mean to require? He went home and required. So I looked it up and the commentary says, of choirs when you assemble people together that are baritones and, and all these different tunes they can sing and they, and they unify them and together they become a choir. They make a beautiful song of praise unto God. He went home and required. He went home and arranged his house. Went home and fixed his house and began to sing praises to God. He messed up. But he fell on his face and he repented. Come on now. And he will always go down and record as the greatest king that ever governed a nation. Why? Because he had the fear of the Lord in him. You know, and repent sounds like such an ugly word to us. You know? Well, what's the first sermon Jesus preached? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's right. And yet, some people don't understand what it really means. I know it means to turn from your sins, but it has multiple meanings. That's right. How many know what a penthouse is and where you find it? You find a penthouse all the way on top. You know what repent means? Get back to that high place in God. Amen. Yes, it means turn from your sin and turn to God, but get back to that place where you were, where you're a child of the king. What are you doing living down there? Get back and be who you're called to be. And quit walking around with your head down because you've been forgiven. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? Come on. But see, as leaders, we've, we've got to know this stuff because people that were deciding are going to make mistakes. And we've got to be able to help them understand. Come on now. If the Bible says, my children, I write these things unto you that you may not sin. But if you do, we have an advocate. We have a lawyer. His name is Jesus. Amen. He'll fight your case for you. Yes. And he will find you innocent in the name of Jesus. Yes. If you only come to him and repent. Come on now. But you can only come to him when you realize you made a mistake. And you serve a loving God that will forgive you if you only humble yourself. Yes. God is looking for people that will love him enough to believe that when they make a mistake, he's there. That's right. We need to teach these new people. We're going to make mistakes. Can you say amen? That's right, yes. You know, a pastor retired after 30 years in the ministry. He got a job at a mortuary. And someone said, Pastor, I don't mean to get into your private life, but I'm a little lost. Why would you do 30 years as a minister? And then finish off in a mortuary. He says, well, as you said, I pastored for 30 years. And for about 10 of those years, I tried to help John to stop drinking. And he still died of cirrhosis of the liver. I tried with all I could to straighten him out. I couldn't do it. And I had Tom and his wife. They were always struggling in their marriage. And I tried to straighten their marriage out. And they still got divorced. And and I tried to straighten this woman's kid out because he was on drugs and I couldn't get him straight. And so 
he ended up dying of an overdose. And I finally came to the conclusion, here in this mortuary, when I straighten people out, they stay straight. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if all the good people were dead? <laughs> and you never had to deal with any problems? But they're not dead, they're alive. Yes, amen. And every new person's gonna walk in with a new problem. Yes. And a new attitude. Come on. Right. And it's gonna take wisdom and love on our part as mature men and women of God to look for the good in them and not the bad. Amen. To look to see what can we do to make them more like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Huh? Come on. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, you read the story when you get home. The Bible says, and Saul said unto Samuel, I have not sinned. See, Samuel has said, I'm going to come back on the seventh day of my deep instructions. Saul goes into a panic because he sees the army surrounding him, and he steps out of his office as king, and he takes in the office that's done his of a priest, and he offers a sacrifice. So the minute he lights a sacrifice, Samuel turns a corner. What are you doing? What are you doing? And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He didn't say I feared the Lord. He feared the people more than God. Wow. And the saddest thing you'll ever read in the scriptures, when I read it, I wept. Because the Bible says, Samuel turned to walk away. And Saul grabbed his robe and he tore it off of him. And Samuel turned and said, the way you tore this robe off of me, God has stripped you of the kingdom. The most horrible thing you could ever say to a man. God is stripping you of your ministry. Come on now. Because you put people before me. Church, we must walk in the fear of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? And we must teach people to have a balanced fear of God. Not a perverted fear. God's not trying to crush you, man. He loves you. Can you say amen? amen? And he's just trying to correct you because he wants to do something unique in your life. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. But God which tries our hearts. Every pastor that stands behind the pulpit has accountability to God to preach the truth. To preach the truth. And not worry about who gets offended because the word of God by itself is offensive. Because if you're living in sin, it's not going to sit right. But if you love God and you love the people in your church, you will preach the full gospel in Jesus' name. You will call sin, sin. And you will preach the truth. Come on now. Amen. But today's pulpits have gotten so perverted. God's called us to be fishers of men. But today's pastors are fishing for compliments. Hmm? They're not trying to fill heaven, they're trying to fill these chairs. And they'll say anything, do anything, compromise, just to fill the building. Don't ever be deceived. Don't ever let the devil lie to you. You come here and our numbers may be a little low. You drive by another church and man, they're, 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 they're stacked up, the cars are stacked up, and you go, man, that church is having revival. How do you know? How do you know? I'll tell you one thing. Numbers don't constitute revival. The Jehovah's Witness fill up Dr. Stadium every year. If they don't repent, they're all going to burn in hell. So don't tell me numbers constitute revival. Repentance constitutes revival. Amen. People that are ready to break before the Lord because they fear him. Can you say that? Because they fear him and they don't want his judgment. And so they're going to do what's right, listen, when no one is watching. When no one is watching. We're talking about raising up men and women of valor. Men that are able or available. Men and women that are available. You don't have to call them every service. You guys okay? You're going to be making tonight? Do you need a ride? No. They're picking people up now. Because they know what their duty is, is to serve the Lord. In season and out of season. Able. Fear God. Men of truth. I said men of truth. Too many liars in the house of God. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15 says, These things write unto thee, hoping to come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, and the pillar 
and the ground of truth. This is where the truth of God is preached. This is where people get set free because the word is preached. People out there are living a lie. Then they come in here and the word of God is preached and it's like a two-edged sword. Come on now. Cuts into them. And they get angry. Why did you tell the pastor about my drinking? Why did you tell the pastor about this? I didn't tell him anything. You liar, you told him. How could he possibly know? It's the Holy Ghost. That's right. Come on. It's called conviction, my friend. Yes. It's called the love of God trying to deliver you and set you free. It's called God pulling your covers. Come on now. Come on. Amen. Why? Because the truth will set you free. That's right. Amen. I said the truth will set you free. Psalms 51 6 says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in thy hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And the new and the new it says, but you desire honesty from the heart, so you can teach me to be wise in my innermost being. Truth is what will set you free. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Don't you find it interesting that even when it comes to worship, Jesus said the time is coming and is already here. That true worshipers will worship God. Why did Jesus Himself say? True worshipers. Because he knew there would be fake worshipers in here. Who aren't really in love with God. They're not sincere. They're here for any other reason except God. They're in here lifting up hands. They're in sin. They're doing things they shouldn't be doing. And they're hypocrites. Job said, so he slay me, yet I will trust him. And I will maintain my own ways because a hypocrite will not stand in the presence of the Lord. God is looking for truth in the inward heart. Okay, you made a mistake. Repent. Get right with God. Let him forgive you. Who cares if someone in the church wants to judge you? They didn't die for you. You're not going to stand before them. Que importa? It doesn't matter. Amen. You get right with God. You live right. Can you say amen? Yes, amen. God is looking for worshipers. You find the story in 2 Kings 5.27 where Gehazi is Elijah's right-hand man. Huh? He heals Naaman the leper through the power of God. And he brings all these stuff together. And then he says, I've come to give you gifts. And he says, this isn't a time to receive gifts. This is a time to give God the glory. But Gehazi, for whatever reason, is tired of working. And he says, you know, I've been working for all this time and I get nothing. They didn't offer me anything. He offered it to him. And I, and I do almost everything for Elijah. When, when am I going to catch a break? So Naaman goes off with his mighty men with their camels loaded with stuff and he goes after him. My master has changed his mind. My master has changed his mind. He says, no problem, man. Take whatever you want. And of course, he took an idiot with him because people that always leave the church take someone stupid with them. <laughs> then they take it and they hide it in the tent. And he goes back to the audacity to come and stand before his leader, Elijah, and he says, hey, how you doing, bro? Oh, I'm just here, you know, just hanging, just chilling. Don't you know that when you left, my heart went with you? Hmm? And he said, listen, I love you. I always have and I always will. What I'm about to tell you is going to be one of the hardest things, if not the hardest things I've ever said to anyone. The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave, cleave unto thee and to thy seed forever. And he went from the presence of a leper, white as snow. He goes out and he lies, a man of God, being discipled by Elijah. You couldn't find someone other than Christ better than that to disciple you. And even that, he falls short because of greed. Now he's a liar. And he hides his stuff and he, then he comes and he stands before his, 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 his leader and he says, where are you coming from? Nowhere. Horrible. And then judgment falls on him. Why? You know why? Because he didn't have the fear of the Lord. He wasn't afraid anymore. Ministry had taken his toll on him. He just didn't care anymore. It wasn't about God anymore. It was about him. And when he became reprobate. You know what the Bible says? Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, you should be a reprobate. You look at the word reprobate. That means unable to discern right from wrong, good from evil. It's the time we're living in now. 
The Bible says what? You know you're in the last days when they call evil good, evil, evil. But the Bible says the word reprobate means unable to discern right from wrong. Now listen to what the last definition says. Unable to save. And I said, wait a minute, Lord. You got to help me. I don't know. I never met this guy that wrote this dictionary. I forget the, the, the writer. But I said, they say he was a Christian, but I don't know. But Lord, to say, unable to save. That's a stretch. You got to talk to me. You got to talk to me. The Lord says, son, don't you get it? When you lie to yourself and you believe your own lies, you're convinced you're not in sin. Come on. And so you're unable to be saved because your mind is so jacked up, you think you're doing nothing wrong. You know what the saddest follow-up I ever did in my life? Was a guy got saved, was a heroin addict. I, he had backslid. it. I went to go follow up on him, and he was all messed up on heroin. I said, brother, you need to come back. God loves you. And he was so reprobate. He goes, oh, brother, you don't understand. I mean, uh, I mean, my life is so good now. The minute I, the minute I walked away from God, the best my life has ever been. Don't you get it? The devil doesn't bother me anymore. I'm free. <laughs> and he strung out on heroin. But in his mind, he's free. You know why? Because he's reprobate. Are you hearing me? Yes, come on. You go back to Samuel. He says, I want you to go and I want you to kill everything. I don't want you to spare anything. Animals. I want the king. I want everything done. That's what the Lord says. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. And Saul says unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And have brought Ahag the king of Amalekite, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord, the God in Gilgal. Listen, I told you what to do. Didn't I tell you to destroy everything? Yeah, you did. Then what? What is this sheep I hear? What is this cries that I hear of, of live animals? Look what he says. And Samuel says to Saul, Yay, I have obeyed the Lord. How dumb can you be? We can hear the sheep. And you stand here saying, I did everything you told me to do. Then he blames it on the people. But the people took of the spoil of the sheep and the ox and the chief things, which should have been destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord. Tries to make it about God now. Tries to turn to disobedience because he has messed up. Are you hearing me tonight? Come on, come on. See, that's what a reprobate mind will do to you. And I've seen so many people walk away from God and get so messed up. Their lives are so miserable. Here's where it gets worse. In 1 Samuel 15, 25, he says, after he tears the robe off of him, he says, Now therefore I pray thee, listen to this, Pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. He says, you know what? I know I messed up. But how about we pretend none of this went down? How about you don't embarrass me in front of all the nation? And how about you make it look like it never really happened? And, and you walk with me so they know that you're still with me. Hey, Pastor, I knew I messed up. And I, I know I shouldn't have slept with him, but... Can I still do the worship? Pastor, you really have to sit me down. Because, you know, people are going to question why I'm not doing the Bible study anymore, Pastor. Pastor, can you please just this time cut me one and just, come on, man, hook me up. Pastor, just kind of look the other way right now. It's sad to say some pastors do. See, when you stop fearing the Lord, you're headed for trouble. Look at the life of Samson. Stop fearing the Lord. And his parents told him, of all the women in the world, why do you got to go there? That's what I want. He knew it was against what God wanted. His family told him, what you're doing is wrong, son. I don't care. I don't care what you're saying. I don't even care what God says. So he goes and he's, what? Flirting with disaster. Flirting with disaster. I saw the movie Samson from 1958 with Victor Mature, and he's laying on her lap. 
Listen to his words. I know you're the devil. But I love you still. <laughs> so there he is. She's stroking his hair and she's playing with God. And he's he's struggling with disaster. He's like, Tell me your secret, Samson. Well, if you tie me with new ropes so she does that, it doesn't work. And the Bible says what she keeps you know, telling him, you lie to me. You lie to me. You say you love me. You don't want to tell me the truth. Come on now. The devil... The devil wants truth. Are you hearing me? The devil wants truth. And the Bible says she wore him out with all her crying and complaining. And he finally told her what? All his heart. He said, if you cut my hair, I'll lose my strength. So he's laying on her lap like the moron that he was. <laughs> laying. Listen carefully. You don't catch anything. You can't just... He was laying on an assassin's lap. A hired assassin would have been hired to kill him. And so when he's laying there, she cuts his hair. And she says, Samson, the Philistines be upon us. And he said, I'll shake myself the way I always did. But he didn't know that God had left him. Didn't know that God had left him. And the first thing they do is they pluck his eyes out with a spoon. Yep. Why, Miss Good, when you walk away from God, the first you're going to lose is your vision. That's right. They take him and they got him grinding. And back in those days, the only two people that grinded were women and animals. They degraded him and put him in that same category. And he's grinding like an animal. And the Bible says his hair begins to grow back. A sign that God was undone yet. His grace was still upon his life. But he was so jacked up. And he knew that God was back. So he tells some kid, could you tie me to these two pillars? I'm tired and I'm weary from grinding and I just stretch myself and my body's tightened up from all the grinding and this kid ties me to the two pillars and on top all the Philistines are having a celebration because they've got the man of God. What does he say? Lord, listen to this stupid prayer. Let me die with my enemy. How foolish can you be? To be a Christian and say, Lord, let me die with the devil. Let me die with my enemy. Now listen carefully. For what they did to my eyes. Let me die for what they did to me. You know, when Daniel, when, 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 when David killed Goliath, you know what he said? You come with a sword and a shield, but I come in the name of the Lord. Amen. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel that saves. David's heart was right with God. And he went in battle because his purpose was right, his heart was right, and God gave him the victory. Amen. Samson said, give me revenge for what they did to me. And in the end, he died with the enemy. And you know what happened? God still delivered the nation because God's word will always come to pass. We're talking about raising leaders tonight. Can you say amen? Yeah, amen. You know, even though there's not many of us here, I believe even at home it's quiet tonight. Because we need to understand something. One of these days, that trumpet's going to sound. That's right. How we talk about it, we boast about it. Make no mistake, my friend. One of these days, that trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ are going to rise. We who remain are going to be caught up to meet the Lord. I don't know about you. I don't want to be ashamed when that day comes. I want to be ready when the Lord comes. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. What happened to Gehazi? He had a covetous spirit. So he went back and said, my master has changed his mind. Give it to me. I'll give it to him. He lied. Cost him his ministry and his life. And not just him, but a cursed second and third and fourth generations because of his foolishness. Covetousness, to desire wrongfully or without regard for the, for the rights of others. Wrongful desire of wealth, power, possessions, or simply put, greedy. Come on now. Horrible. You ever, you ever had a friend who 
you thought was a friend until you found out how greedy they are? You don't want them as friends anymore. Because they're so tight, they walk when they squeak. Come on, they squeak when they walk. They're just tight. Every time you go eat, they pretend they're taking out their wallet. They don't even have one. They're so used to you paying. Come on now. They're good actors too. Oh, you got it? They respect it. There's nothing back there. You don't want it. The guys don't have pockets. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 3 through 6 says what? But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become the saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words because of these things covet the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. A covetous man who is an idolater. Because whatever you, you, you steal or take that really isn't yours, you rejoice because you got it and that turns into your God now. You begin to become an idolater. That becomes your idol and you worship that. Come on now. See, we're looking to raise the people that understand our money isn't ours, it's God's. That's right. We're just stewards of the manifold grace of God. And it is required that we be faithful. Can you say it? Good, and our level of maturity and faith can be determined by our level of giving. Mm -hmm. I, I can't stress it enough. We just took one offering. Mm -hmm. We didn't put money in the basket. We put faith. That's right. It's not money. You're putting faith and you're saying, this is how much I believe. Come on now. That's what we're saying. Every time when we pay our tithes, come on somebody. We give an offering to our, the house of God. And we're demonstrating how much we believe. Are you hearing me? Yes, amen. That money doesn't rule over me. I rule it. Can you say amen? Yes, yes I know I need it. But it's not going to govern my life. Come on now. No, it's, it's time that we understand God wants us blessed so we can do more for the kingdom of God. Back to Samuel. Chapter 15, verse 7. And small, Saul smote the Amalekites from Babylon until the cometh to show that is over against Egypt. And he took, and he took of the things of the Amalekites alive and did not early destroy all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and all the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the families of the lambs, all that was good and would not destroy them. What do you do? You were told to destroy it. And you just go take? And you want to say, I did what you told me to do with your reprobate mind. Then it goes deeper, and then you say, okay, I did it, I messed up, I confessed, but still honor me anyway. Don't embarrass me, don't shame me. You're not perfect. That's what people do. When you're pleading your case, you know you did something wrong. Right? Come on. Huh? Come on. And this is people have to plead their case. Saul turned to go away, laid hold of the skirt of his mantle and ran it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from this. David hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than you. You come to church, we can say God begins to move in us and we think we're something when we're nothing. Come on. And God says, You know what? I don't need you. I'm going to take what I have blessed you and we'll give it to someone better than you. Yep. Someone better than you. We're talking about raising up men and women of integrity, can you say amen? Yes. Men and women of conviction. Men and women that are, that are determined to do right in the house of God. Come on now. Yes. Bring honor to the kingdom of God and raise up more people, can you say amen? Because the Bible says this was being so desirous of you that we don't want to impart the gospel of God only, but our very souls. Yes. I just want to show you how to pray, read outreach, give. I want to show you what a man of God is. Yes, want to show you what it means to love God and serve God. Come on now. Yes. You know, I've been saved 40 years and I say, Lord, okay now, what, what, what do I do? Talk to me. What do, I, what, what do I do to the churches? What do I what do I say to help? He says, you just tell them what you did that kept you safe for 40 years. Because mm -hmm. if it worked for you, it'll work for them. Simple mathematics, man. Have a prayer life. Can you say amen? amen. Never miss church. Mm. 
Come on. Never miss church. Yes. And if one of the kids is sick, mama stays home. Come on. Because you're the priest of the home. That's you right. come to church. That's come on, right. somebody. Yes. Amen. You bring all your time to the house of God. Not half, not some. All your tithe. And do you know that when you do that, you don't have to pray over your money? You can if you want to. But you don't have to because you know what? God has given you a promise. If you bring all your tithe, I will rebuke the devourer for you. You don't have to trip. That's right. You do your part, I'll do mine. Yes. Right. And if you don't do your part, I won't do mine. Because I'm a covenant God. If you break covenant, there's no agreement anymore. But if we remain faithful, God will bless us financially. Come That's on. Right, yeah. And your children. Can you say amen? Yes, amen. amen? This is all simple but yet profound stuff that we need to keep teaching when you're listening to me. Yeah. Like exercise. You want to build that muscle? Then keep working it. Yeah. Come on. You want to teach people. Listen, when, when people go to your house for lunch or dinner, this thing's ending. When they go to your house for a barbecue, come on now. See your beautiful home or your TV or your car or your furniture or your dog running around. Come on now. Oh, you guys are blessed. Think before you speak. Don't just say, well, you know, I've been on the job for 12 years. My wife's been on the job for eight, you know. God's been good to us. No. What you're seeing is the fruit of what happens when you give. Amen. Don't say, you know, I did this. No. I thank God that when I got saved, someone taught me to fear the Lord and to give. Amen. And not to touch the tithe because it's holy unto the Lord. Let me close with this thought. There's a story of a mama eagle who's starting to get her eaglets out. She's kicking them out one by one. And one would come back, then he'd go again because they had their fears. There's still some in there that haven't even tasted the air yet. And so she goes out to get them something to eat. She's flying around and she's looking for some meat. One that has already flown out for a little bit, has spread his wings, comes back, and he's wondering, where's mom? Well, she went out to look for some meat. He said, well, why is mom bothering trying to find meat when there's a prophet right there sacrificing meat to God? There's meat right there. What's wrong with mom? Does she not see or smell that there's meat right there? And so he says, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll bless mom. I'll show mom that I'm grown up. And I'll fly down there and I'll steal that piece of meat and bring it into the nest. So this baby eagle flies down and he steals the meat off the altar of God. And, oh, he doesn't realize that when he stole it, there was a piece of hot coal stuck underneath the meat. Lays it in the nest and the nest catches fire. And those that have never learned how to fly die. What's the moral story? Hmm? You burn God, you're only going to burn yourself. That's right. You're not going to burn the Lord and think you're going to win. Come on. Huh? But when you fear the Lord and you honor Him, and you know that the tithe is holy, can you say amen? Amen. Look at what people tell you. Let me tell you something, man. The devil's such a liar. For every sermon you'll find on good giving and tithing, you'll find a hundred or more on why not to give. Did Jesus tithe? Did the disciples tithe? Why we should not tithe over and over again? And you got Christians that struggle with giving. They go, hey, maybe I shouldn't give. Come on. No, we need men and women of God that are givers. They can say, this is what giving does. Right. God will bless your life. Can you say amen? Yes, amen. All these things, come on now. We need availability. Yes. yes. That's right. We need availability. Come amen. We need to walk in the fear of the Lord. Can you say amen? Yes. We need truth. Are you hearing me? Truth. Truth. Be truthful to your pastor. Be honest. Yes. Last but not least, quit being covetousness. And learn how to be liberal. Can you say amen? amen? The liberal soul will be made fat. Man, God will bless you. Be on your wild streams. You'll go wild. Mm -hmm. You'll say, why has God given me so much? What's going on here? Huh? That's what God will do to you. I want to close. And I pray that God spoke to you tonight, challenged you to come back to church. The pastor gets back from Chicago. Or maybe you're in another church, but that you would go back. Even if you come in gloves and a mask, don't let nobody judge you. You, you, you let the Lord judge you. Yes, yes amen. But if, you, if you feel safe with your children, and if you don't want to put the kids in Sunday school, that's fine too. Get with the pastor. Yeah. 
Yes, and sit right. in the back and, and protect them. That's fine. But come back. That's right. Come back. Yes. Come back already. Come you don't realize what you're doing to your family. Come on. Come back and, and let the Lord restore you. Come on, somebody. Come and, and let's break bread together. Let's yes. laugh and smile again. Come yeah, on, God. That's right. Amen. And last but not least, let's believe that God's about to fill this house with souls. Amen. And we're going to need workers. Yes. People that will rise up and not be afraid to work and say, Pastor, what can I do for you? Come on now. Come on. What can I do? Matter of fact, I want to throw you one last thought. When David is giving thanks to all the men that helped him get to be where he was, he wasn't dumb. It's recorded in the scriptures. To this tribe, he says, uh, you know, these men were, were, were warriors. They could fight with their right and with their left. This tribe, this man fought a lion on ice and killed him, grabbed him by the beard and slew him. This man here, he killed a thousand people for a field of beans and he goes on. These mighty men of God, killers. And the last tribe, were the children of Ishkoshim, who were men of wisdom, who knew what needed to be done and did it. Amen. You know what the greatest asset is to any pastor in the world? Men and women that come in here, see something, they just handle it. Yes. Amen. They don't ask, Pastor, why is there no toilet paper? Pastor, why is there? No, you just handle it. Come on. You'll be the greatest asset to this house, and God will bless your house. Yes. You believe that? Give God a praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to play one song, give you an opportunity at home and here to just worship God with us in Jesus' name. I hope it's going to Hallelujah. If you know it, just lift your voice and make it your prayer, not just a song. Come on, help me sing.
Hallelujah. Here I am to worship. Here 